We're back on the road this April with our live show, Cocaine Cowboys. If you want to hear the story of Ireland's love affair with Colombian powder and those who made millions in the gold rush, join us in Galway's Town Hall Theatre on Saturday 6th of April, Killarney's INEC on Saturday the 13th of April. Tickets for Belfast's show have sold out on Ticketmaster.ie, but limited availability remains at ulsterhall.co.uk. That's ulsterhall.co.uk. Alison, an enormous story breaking in the north of Ireland today. Um, We're going to be careful about what we report around this, but nonetheless, Geoffrey Donaldson has resigned as DUP leader um, after being charged with historical sex offences. Astonishing. I mean, today, sitting here, it's Good Friday. You know, the biggest story they ever come out, I suppose, of this part of the world is the Good Friday Agreement. I thought today would have been a nice, easy day's work running into the Easter holidays. And then this is story, and it's probably I mean, it's the biggest story of this year, if not this decade. Um, Jeffrey Donaldson, a huge figure within unionism, you know, a complete titan within unionism, the leader of the DUP and MP for Lagan Valley. And um, rumours that he was the person. Police had put out a statement last night saying that a 61-year-old man and a 57-year-old woman had been charged in relation to non-recent um, sex abuse cases. The woman has been charged with aiding and abetting. To be clear, she's not charged with any kind of sexual offence. She's charged with aiding and abetting an offence. Um, and there was rumours that this was Jeffrey Donaldson. That was confirmed today beyond any reasonable doubt when the DUP themselves, we were told... The jungle drums were telling me that the DUP party officers had all received messages calling them to an emergency meeting. That emergency meeting went on for several hours. And at the end of that, they released a statement saying that he was resigning with immediate effect. Of course, like he has actually been charged, hasn't he, Alison? Like it's, yeah. he hasn't actually appeared in court. That's coming up uh, later this month. But he, No, it's it, what's called a 28 day charge. So you're charged to court to appear in 28 days from now. So the um, he will appear at near the end of April in the magistrate's court in Newry, um, both himself and his co-accused. And at that point in time, then there will be a plea here and then it would be sent to the Crown Court for trial. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, our, our legal system is incredibly slow. He'll appear, he'll make his first appearance on April the 24th, Newry Magistrate's Court. And after that, then there'll be a series of other smaller hearings and then it will be sent to the higher court, to the Crown Court, um, we would imagine then for a full trial. This depends obviously on pleas and all sorts of other things that, you know, we're speculating on at this point in time. But yeah, mm. and our legal system runs quite slow. So this could, you know, could take a year to come to trial, maybe even more. So and what of Jeffrey Donaldson up until today, his image and the kind of character he came across as and, and has been, you know, he's been lauded essentially as being yeah. a pretty clean cut guy. I mean, 24 hours ago, Jeffrey Donaldson was heading towards retirement in the House of Lords. He would have been sitting on the benches of the Lords. He would have seen out his retirement there in a very cushy existence. He would have been known. He's staunchly unionist. He's, you know, a, a member of the Orange Order. Um, and he would be considered, you know, of that sort of very socially conservative wing of unionism. You know, there was no hint of any kind of, I, I suppose, any of these kind of allegations around him before. That's why it's all came as such a surprise to everybody. And in terms of his career, he was he was right now. He was at the height, I suppose, of his career in terms of how things were going. He had went back and managed to get the um, British government in the EU to renegotiate the Brexit deal. He had went back again and had more changes made to that, albeit people would argue he made claims that he had removed the sea border and that is not the case. But he did manage to get that deal past his party officers. He got the assembly restored. Um, that was a big issue. It'd been over two years. There'd been no government and things were functioning nicely. You know, we had all these nice images of our first minister, Michelle O'Neill and deputy first minister, Emma Little Pengelly, who's a very, very close friend and ally of Jeffrey Donaldson, out and about together, you know, up playing Kamogi on a pitch and then Michelle O'Neill going to the shankle with Emma Pengelly. Everything seemed to have been going well. And in terms of his career, he was probably at the height of his powers and then for it all to come crashing down in such a dramatic fashion, you know, and it really has been a dramatic few hours. You know, every journalist in Northern Ireland is just been flat out working on this story. You know, newsrooms are in complete disarray and you'll be unsurprised to know that our lawyers are all earning their money today. I mean, he was he, like this during the Belfast Agreement, he was maybe part of the hardline faction, like 
you know, on Good Friday that 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 wouldn't sign up really. Uh, he was yeah. in the U- UUP at that stage. But all these years later, he kind of had his moment where he was kind of very much lauded. He had a recent speech in in, in the House of Commons um, where he, that sort of civil society were embracing him really at this stage. And he's sort of more middle ground as opposed to... Well, he, he, he had become, that way, yeah. become middle ground, but yeah. he started off as a kind of a, a hard line voice mm. in the UUP. Yeah, he was, he was a defector from the UUP. So he left the Ulster Unionist Party in protest at the Good Friday Agreement, along with Arling Foster. They defected at the same time. Both went on to lead the DUP. Um, the DUP, when Arling Foster, then there was, um, when she left that post, there was actually, the party actually elected Edwin Putz to the job as party leader. He lasted a very brief length of time. I think I remember saying one time that I had a bottle of shampoo that I'd bought and it had <laughs> lasted longer than, Je- than Edwin Putz's <laughs> leadership. And so Jeffrey Donaldson came the city, grew through the leader, but he adapted into that role with, with great ease. You know, he really did. Um, he clearly wanted that role. He It was something that he had wanted his legacy to show. Um, he wanted to restore the assembly. Now, he stood on those hardline um, Brexit platforms alongside people like Jim Allister um, in protest at the sea border. He collapsed the assembly because of the DUP's opposition to the sea border and the, the Brexit arrangements. And he maintained that sort of hardline stance up until the point where I would say he would have been probably one of the more forward-thinking members of the DUP in terms of his politics when he realised that if you want to preserve Northern Ireland as part of the union, making it a, you know an ungovernable political basket case probably isn't the best way to go about it. And so he did a job of work. I mean, some will say he maybe hoodwinked some of the members of the DUP into believing this deal had achieved something that it hadn't. But regardless of that, Things seem to have been ticking along quite nicely, even those really opposed to him within the DUP. And we're talking like people like Sammy Wilson and, and Ian Paisley in Westminster. They weren't making that much noise. They were saying, you know, well, look, this deal doesn't deliver everything it's promised. They weren't calling for him to resign. They weren't attacking him. There was no motion so, you know, of no confidence in him. There was nothing like that happening. So he would have, I suppose, been thinking this is, you know, a free run till the general election expected to take place, you know, sometime later this year. And his Lagan Valley seat, albeit he his vote has been reducing gradually over the years, is a fairly safe DUP seat, or it was at least. You know, I mean, the, it must put the DUP under huge pressure now at this stage, because kind of he had that that authority that like you spoke about that even if people disagreed with him on the on the sea border, they they didn't launch personal attacks. And that kind of yeah. held the DUP together. I mean, it must be now they must be really thrown into a state of chaos. Mm. They must be reeling. Well, yeah, there's some will be will be reeling and some will be very upset and some will probably be secretly quite pleased that they will now be able to assert their views within that, those sort of hardliner views. Now, no one, at, at the end of this, and I have to say that all the other politicians and political leaders, including Sinn Féin, the Ulster Unions, everyone else, they put out very brief statements. Obviously, everyone has to be legally very carefully, but they're all saying, you know, this is a legal process. Now, let the legal, legal process take its course. Um, and at some point, like, you know, there, there is people, you know, actual real people's lives at the centre of this. But politically, if you move away from that, you know, there's people who didn't want this deal to go ahead. They didn't particularly want the assembly restored. And their views, I suppose, they were trying to keep quiet. They were keeping their powder dry. Now there's an opportunity for them to try and start moving themselves in, get someone who is more of their line of way of thinking into that leadership position, pull the DUP back back over again towards the hard line. Um, and that is where they would feel more comfortable. You know, these are people who would feel more comfortable in the um, the TUV, which is that really radical, you know, super right wing, um, conservative breakaway group, if you like, run by Jim Mallister. But they knew they would never get elected under a TUV ticket. So they've remained in the DUP, albeit they're the hardliners. And this is a perfect opportunity, I suppose, for them to very quietly start moving themselves back in to positions of influence. And, you know, Jeffrey Donaldson, regardless of what happens, and we know that the legal process will take its course, but regardless of what happens, I'm pretty sure as we're sitting here today, his career is over. You know, his political mm. career, let's face it, is over. As a person, I don't know, you know, where he ever goes from this, but I do, you know, we can pretty be sure that the, the Jeffrey Donaldson time in the DUP and his reign in the DUP is completely over. And the statement that they released, um, the DUP, they, you know, I thought that I was I was shocked at the wording of it because at that point in time, 
no one had definitively linked him to these allegations and they basically did. And that was it. You know, all speculation was over then. And really, that's why, you know, that his name and the headline started and obviously the flood of media that came in, it's because they confirmed it because up to that yeah. point, nobody was in a position, there was text flying around our phones and you, you've you been, you said yours has been hopping since last night, but like it is quite peculiar. Was it purposefully done, do you think? Or, or was it something that they possibly misunderstood? No, I don't think there's been a misunderstanding. There's a, an awful lot of lawyers in the DUP, you know, an awful lot of their their um, politicians are former lawyers and barristers. So I don't think that it was done by accident. It was it was done pretty much on purpose. And the wording of that, you know, it left, I suppose, us assuring us, no doubt that this had to be reported in this way. You have to report that statement. You can't not report that statement in that in that fashion. And that, you know, I, I do think that that shows that the DUP, far from giving him any kind of cover or saying, you know, well, we'll put out a one-line statement saying you've resigned, which they could have done. They could have just said, Jeffrey Donaldson stepped down as party leader. We won't be commenting anymore mm-hmm. um, because of, you know, legal implications. And let it go with that. But the fact that they extended that, I think it shows that there are some people within that party officer team specifically who thought, well, this is our chance. Get rid of him. And then let's see. And so there is an interim leader who's, who... Um, has been put in, who's um, Gavin Robinson, and he is also quite moderate. He's of that very moderate wing of the DUP, I suppose, if you can ever say the DUP are moderate, you know, they're hardline unionists, but he, I suppose, would be of the more middle ground. Mm. Um, will he want that job? I don't think he does. He's never given any indication that he wants to be party leader. Um, so then it's down to who else wants to step in and, and take that job. And I mean, all of this happened pretty quickly. There's no suggestion that... Um the DUP were aware of any investigation no going on because, of course, you know, you don't just land charges on somebody. There's obviously, you know, a case has been built which Jeffrey Donaldson will in the future be able to plead guilty or not guilty to and whatever, which way that goes. Um, I'm trying to think if... I can, I can there tell is, you is there a, in the DUP knew that this was going to happen hmm. because I went through every contact that I had and they were actually messaging me, asking me for information. Nobody knew all that we knew that yesterday that Jeffrey Donaldson cleared his diary yesterday. That's all we know. He was meant to speak at a DUP breakfast, um, business breakfast with some business leaders. And he canceled that and someone else stood in in place of him. He was meant to do um, a pre-recorded interview with the BBC, which would have went out today. And he cancelled that. Nobody knew why. There was, you know, um, there was no reason given. And then last night, then the police released a statement saying that two people, a man and a woman, had been charged in relation to these non-recent, as they call them, offences. And then obviously, as of this morning, emergency DUP meeting, all hell breaking loose, and then a statement from the DUP. And that's pretty much the the sort of line that we have been following. That's pretty much how the chain of events unfolded. And I suppose to put our crime hats on for a minute um, and take the political ones off. But, you know, again, to come to a position that somebody's charged before the courts, they have more than likely been arrested and quizzed in relation to, you know, allegations have been put to them in, under arrest, which could have been something that happened, um, you know, months ago. Yeah, I mean, it, it could have been under, we don't know the exact date of the complaint. I have asked the police to give me the exact wording of the charges because that could maybe help us try and work that out. The PPS will review this. So the police charge you to court. Um, this wasn't by way of a PPS summons. So you would assume then he has been into the police station yesterday, been charged with this, and then they um, are released and given a date to appear in court. That's usually how these things work. With historic cases like this, those non-recent cases, and often it will be by pre-arranged interview, you know, it will not be the police coming around at seven in the morning, kicking your door in. It will be by arrangement with the solicitor um, rather than that. But I mean, it, it given obviously that this has been going on in the background, it's it's been quite a job that he's done keeping it from everyone within the party because they were completely as, as shocked as the rest of us were this morning. And I know that. I know this isn't people just, you know, telling me one thing when they know something else or speaking out of both sides of their mouth. I know from the reaction to mm. people that I was speaking they were to stunned. The DUP that mm. they were stunned, they were mm. shocked. I mean, I think from the, the position of the DUP, if somebody is the leader of your party and they're facing uh, uh, charges of this nature, and even if they have a sort of anonymity under you know, a, a legal sort of anonymity, they were probably in a position where it's it's quite unsustainable when it's 
Mm. The public know it anyway. Yeah. And maybe they felt that that you can't have somebody, a public figure like that. Yeah. It is different than a yeah. But sure, when I was person. coming in earlier after speaking to you and to you in relation to it, I was coming in and listening to the news and top of the news was, you know, an unnamed man in, in the north. Mm. I mean, this is down here. Uh, two people had been charged in relation to historical sex abuse. And then the next story was uh, the story I think it might have been reported in your own Belfast Telegraph that uh, he had deleted all his social media accounts some days previous. Yeah. So these two stories were sort of hanging. Of course, you know, I knew uh, the situation because I'd been speaking to you guys, but you'd you'd wonder like at that point, everything was disjointed until the DUP statement brought it all together. Yeah. I mean, Alison will tell you more about the, the laws that have come in in the North about yeah. name, naming sex offenders. They're different than, than we have now. They've yeah. been much, there's been a series of judgments in, Engl in English courts around privacy yeah. and, and also laws that have been brought in in the North. So it could have been a situation where um, in this case, Jeffrey Donaldson would never have been named. It would have been absolutely illegal to be named, and he would have he could have been effectively the leader of the country. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, um, maybe you, you don't know, but I, I'll ask you anyway. You know, we've spoken about his political career. Do we know anything about his personal life? Is he a married man? Is he a family man? Or what? You know. Yeah, he he is married with children, and he is someone who he always came across as you know. He would give the, the impression of someone who was a very sort of socially conservative family man. He's from quite a large family. Um, and I've actually had conversations long in the past with him about this because obviously the tradition in the past would have been for Catholic families, especially in the 50s, 60s and 70s, have quite large families and lots of children. And for Protestant families to be very small, whereas Jeffrey Donaldson has quite a large family. Um, he has I think, something like seven, seven brothers and sisters, um, or there are seven of them in the family. But he... Yeah, he would have came across as that, you know, very, very, as you said, very unionist, someone who left the party in protest at David Trimble's decision to go in to sign the Good Friday Agreement. And then obviously after St. Andrews, the DUP went in, he was, um, I suppose, a, a very loyal supporter then of Ian Paisley and Peter Robinson. And he's someone who's seen as a sort of calm head, you know, someone who would be, um, I think that the, the British government found him a lot easier maybe to negotiate with than some other members of the DUP. And that, I mean, the thing that I suppose that struck me today, and leaving aside all of these things, and we know that's terrible and we have to bear in mind the sensitivities of what exactly it is that he's being accused of, he was literally at the height of his political powers. You know, he, you know, he was safely elected into Lagan Valley, whether or not he was going to stand an election in the next election or then he was going to be boxed off with a seat in the House of Lords, which is where most um, DUP leaders or ex-leaders find themselves. But there was a plan in place, clearly a future plan in place for what he was going to do. And as of now, that is all in tatters, you know, no matter what happens. And we know this, no matter what happens, there's no recovery from something like this. And no. that is why that emergency meeting of the DUP party officers, that resignation and that statement all has, has came so quickly. There's no dilly-dallying around here. You know, there's no, let's take a bit of time and see what happens. This all happened very quickly this morning. I mean, it'll be strange as well for him to, you know, within his community, uh, as you say, this case could take a long time to meander its way through the courts. Um, You know, he... Yeah, but he remains, he remains a, a, an MP in... in obviously in, in the so House of Commons that, yeah, and all of those. That, no, that's, that's the next big thing that will be a question. What is going to happen with his MP seat? It, surely, if he's resigned as leader of the DUP, can he still maintain that, that MP seat? Will he have to then stand down from that as well? You would imagine he would have to give up that seat. That is probably maybe a story for another day and what how we will hear from him, I don't know, and what form we will hear from that, I, I really don't know. But it does seem that it would be impossible for him to continue on as an MP, albeit there's an election coming soon and he would have had to make a decision whether to stand or not then. But, it, you know, they are, they are all the follow-up questions that are going to come. What is going to happen next? What is going to happen with that Westminster CT then is going to replace him? And also then, I mean, if we're to go completely into the political sphere, something like this damages not just one person, but the whole of unionism as a whole, and the DUP certainly will suffer. And in this election, they are under real pressure from the lands, from that middle ground, which has just been mopping up those softer unionist votes for years, election upon election, they make gains. 
and they were really targeting Jeffrey Donaldson's Langan Valley seat, Sorsha Eastwood, who is the Alliance Party representative there. She has really raised her profile and increased her vote um, dramatically in the last election, and she really has her eye on the prize in terms of that seat. We also have the person who is now standing in for for um, Jeffrey Donaldson now is gone, Gavin Robinson. He's under real pressure in East Belfast from the Lands Party leader Naomi Long. So, you know, this, let's face it, it's not going to be good for your electoral prospects. Is it something like this happening? And, you know, the winners of, of that, I suppose, if there is an electoral decline and people either choose not to vote for the DUP or just not to come out and vote at all. But then what you can see is that middle ground taken up all those softer, softer votes and taking those seats from the DUP, which, you know, that would be seismic. Jeffrey Johnson once had I said, the, the safest of safe seats. He's been for the MP for Lagan Valley for as long as I can remember. And for that then to go out of DUP hands and fall into the Alliance hands. And like we're really jumping ahead of ourselves now because she was quite some distance off that, but she has been making headway. I'm um, sure she's been in terms of that. You know, they could lose their seats because mm. of this. Mm. Um, and that once once a seat changes hands like that into a softer party, it rarely goes back to the hard line again. You know, once it's gone, it's gone. Mm, for sure. I mean, between the three of us, can anybody think of, you know, a sitting politician, a party leader who before has been brought before the courts? No, I mean, well, it's you extremely know, rare. And, you know, the, the, I mean, obviously... The, not even just on these particular no. charges, but on any criminal charges. Can you think of anybody that was... Um, I mean, it's in terms of here, it, it generally is unprecedented. And let's face it, we don't have particularly normal politics here <laughs> anyway at the best of times. But even in, in those, in that respect, it's been, you know, it's been a day where most people who have been messaged may have just been going, what on earth? You know, what on earth has mm-hmm. happened? I, I think as well in Jeffrey Donaldson's persona, like there's been a lot of very brash politicians obviously up the north on all sides of the spectrum and you know very kind of wild characters even beyond any paramilitarism or anything like that yeah. but Jeffrey Donaldson really was the opposite to that mm. like a very sort of mild mannered sort of Christian it's guy very, very much so and and I think that that adds to the shock because mm. even yeah. even even his manner that kind of soft spoken and you know an intelligent guy clearly um, it, it just adds to the shock where just wasn't that type of persona, you know, and obviously he's 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 an innocent man. Absolutely. And that's been that's been uh, set out that he's he's you know, we haven't heard him plea or make any comment on yeah. it at all. But I just think that that the public perception of him mm. um, adds yeah. to some of the shock. I hope you were. I don't even know why it slipped my mind, but in terms of someone who obviously fell on their sword, um, because of allegations about their their personal life, the famous Iris Robinson story mm. when she was um, revealed to have been having an affair with a very young man, and that ended her political career as well at that at that time. Um, but I mean, I suppose it's just you know, Iris always would have been considered someone who had a bit of an edge to her, and you know, it didn't particularly surprise a lot of people. Whereas this, you know, as you say, the persona. Is a someone incredibly straight laced, you know, um, very sort of church going, you know, straight down the line unionist, and yeah, I suppose that all adds the shock of it. But I mean, I don't think anything can make it more shocking. It's just been one of those days where you know, every time I answer my phone, it's you know another journalist. What is going on? You know what's yeah. happened? Yeah, um, it's definitely one of those days. I was going to say to you, um, had your plans. For the Easter weekend, were you going to, you know, take yourself off to the couch, nibble some chocolate and watch a movie? There is not, I'm going to say there's not a child washed in this house. There is not a thing done. This was the day I was going to go and buy my shopping and my dinner. There'd be not a potato on a plate come Easter Sunday. I have nothing done and I don't think I'm going to get anything done for the rest of this day anyway. I wouldn't have thought so. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be busy. You know, it's just, you know, and, and so many queries from so many people. And obviously as well, it's a story that has so much sensitivity around it too, that, you know, we're treading so carefully and rightly so, you know, yeah. you have to remember there are real people's lives here, but um, it's, it's one of those stories that, you know, not even in terms of how we had to handle that this morning and in terms of even the media law and what we've talked about that goes around it. Like I have said to people on the phone today, they will be teaching this in media law classes, in journalism classes, mm-hmm. you know, for decades to come. This will be used as an example of how would you have handled this? How would you report this? And what does the law say? Because, you know, it is a legal minefield as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Did you get any Easter eggs? I, I've uh, b- bought any or no, received any. No, give you one. Oh, nobody gives me any. My mother gave me one. <laughs> a munchies. <laughs> you know those well, my, my, my mom will give me one now I have to say she it's doesn't pathetic give me though yet. isn't it you know well, at our age know. in life wanting an easter egg and I well, can't believe that your mom's are buying these easter eggs at your age you know what I did my mother would give easter eggs to mine for and I ate two of them so I have to go out and buy another two and replace them but you know there's actually you, you'd be lucky to get an easter egg now today we should really. I sh- get nothing. I am sitting here as I told you. There's nothing there, done anyway. We'll there's see. There's nothing left. In there's the a, jobs. Yeah, there's a drought. Ah, uh, stop! I'm telling you. I'm going to have a panic attack now. Well, you get the uh, you get the the, the be, cheaper I'd ones. I'd be hopping around supermarkets at midnight tonight to get stopped by every wee bitty on the way down to, tell, to ask me what's what nurse going on in the DUP. And to buy your leg of lamb, isn't that what yeah. everybody eats on on Easter Sunday? Yeah. Anyway, happy Easter. Enjoy the rest of it. I'm sure you're not going to take get much time off, but thanks a million for coming on no, and no. um. Definitely, you are the expert on on Jeffrey Donaldson, this background. And, you know, it's one story, isn't it, where your political and your crime uh, two genres are meeting, colliding, literally. I, yeah, I just didn't expect them to collide in this way. And that's, yeah. that's yeah. the thing. Nobody expected this, but we'll see. All right. Thanks a million, Alison. Thanks, Alison. No bother. I'm Nicola Talent, and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. 